You are about to listen to Upon the Rock broadcast with Pastor Lauren Shakir of Foundation of the World Church. It is our prayer that each teaching will help build a godly foundation in your life. Please be sure to visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for further information about this ministry and to view more teachings. Now, here is today's message. All right, I've been dealing with the kingdom of heaven last week and actually a couple of weeks before that, I just didn't call it the kingdom of heaven, but it was God's system of operation, God's system of God's way of doing things and being right. And so a lot of times when you hear the kingdom of heaven, most people, they said, I never knew what the kingdom of heaven really was. I heard about it, but I never knew what the kingdom of heaven is. Well, the kingdom of heaven simply is God's way of doing things, God's attitudes, God's functionalities, God's ways of how he operate. Again, if you are from America, you are from the kingdom of America. If you go over to Britain or to England or to Africa or to Australia, your culture, because you are from a different kingdom, it's kind of foreign to everybody else. They do things over there that you're not used to and you do things that they're not used to. Well, God's system of operation works the same way. God has a kingdom, a system that he operates in heaven and it's so foreign to the world system, okay? So the world has spent all of your life telling you this is how it's supposed to work. But the kingdom of heaven is saying, no, this is the original way. And it may conflict with the world. For example, she was talking about what the, you know, look down from heaven and, um, you know, give, you know, most of the time people have a problem with, we're going to touch on the money thing a little bit because people have a problem with that because it's a system, actually. If you all don't know it, it's actually a God. It's a God system that makes up the world. And so the money system of the world and the money system of heaven are two different things. Now he's not saying the, the money is the wrong thing, he's saying the system is wrong. And that goes with finances, that goes with friends, that goes whatever it is that you are lacking in, there's a system behind it, okay? Um, I taught a teaching about a few years back called Body, Soul, and Spirit. I'm not sure if y'all remember that. But I describe different systems of every area where you're at. Everything has a body and a soul and a spirit to it. And I, I brought that illustration to let you know that it's not just the, the tangible thing that's evil, but the system or the spirit or the mindset behind it can make it evil. Okay? So maybe you all probably could look at that when you, whenever you get a chance. It kind of helps ties into what I'm talking about. But today, I want to talk about kingdom citizens. Kingdom citizens and I put all these different cultures up here on purpose because kingdom citizens Are not church folk They can be but kingdom citizens are people of the kingdom and I'm gonna get I'm gonna get into a lot of stuff right now, but um, I want you all to know that you can't walk up to somebody and say, oh, you're a kingdom citizen. It's something that they do. It's something about the way they operate where you recognize your kingdom. It's just like military people. Military people recognize military people. It's the way you talk, the way you handle, the way you say certain words, the way you stand. They say, where'd you serve? They kind of can pick it up. Well, kingdom people are the same way. They may look different they may have all kinds of different stuff on them and just by looking at them you can't tell but when they start operating and start talking you'll say you're kingdom aren't you and they say yes I am and then you have this kind of common denominator thing but don't think just because and I thank God for people when we come to church but don't think everybody who come to church is kingdom now they can be but there are a lot of people that are just church members and there are people that are kingdom citizens y'all follow what i'm saying yes. my objective in this teaching is to help you recognize and to help you develop into a kingdom citizen instead of just a church person because all of our life i think mr sandra was just saying it i've been in church all my life but i started to develop she said i started to develop well that's kingdom minded stuff you're starting to see god's way of doing things instead of just church because church can have its own system that's outside of the Bible, it's outside of God's ways. 
And I and y'all have been in most churches and you've seen some of the stuff like that ain't even God. Like, what are you doing? That is just foolishness. That has had nothing to do with the kingdom. So what I attempt to do is, of course, as we build this church, because this church, you know, in January, the church will be three years old. Woohoo! Three years old. <laughs> most people don't last. Well, some of the new churches that I've seen, some of them don't get past the first or second year, but we're about to hit three years in January, which also means I will be preaching the gospel for 18 years. Wow. Yes. I got called January 1st, 2000 wow. on a watch night service, came outside, going to my car, and the Lord says, I'm calling you, and he said, and several others for this next move of God, for this next move, and, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't even really read, read the Bible. I was just a guy trying to work on my relationship with God, and I came out that watch night service, and he says, you are going to be, and I didn't even hear this term really right, but the way I heard it is like, you're one of my millennial preachers. And so that was January 1st, 2000, and then it's about to be January 1st, 2018, and I've just been on this track ever since. Uh, and it's been wonderful, too, you know, because I never thought that, I didn't even know I was going to own a church. I, I just thought I was going to be some kind of preacher that would kind of go around and talk and give people the word or whatever. I didn't know all of this, what, what happened out of that one call. So anyway, that's just my little quick story. But let me show you all when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, because I get a lot of people who still don't understand what is the kingdom of heaven? What do you mean by kingdom of heaven? Is the temperature okay? It's cold. It's cold. Are you cold? Because you're the polar bear now. Oh. You good? Okay, you can put a little heat on because I've seen everybody breaking out the sweaters and blankets. But some of y'all just love the blankets because it's just comfortable, <laughs> comfortable to you. But um, say out loud the king, or kingdom citizens. Say it again, kingdom citizens. kingdom citizens. Now, kingdom citizens are God's people who have God's attitudes, God's attributes, God's functionality. Again, I don't want you all to start thinking that it's church people. However, it can be people who go to church because I go to church. Some people will call me probably maybe a churchman, but me, I'm more of a kingdom citizen who go to church, who reads the Bible, who teach other people about the things. I'm obviously part of the fivefold ministry, okay? Uh, but I'm still a kingdom citizen, all right? So in kingdom citizens, it doesn't mean everybody is preachers. There are different levels when it comes to kingdom citizens. Some people are called to help push. Some people are called to help administrate. Some people are called to be out front to give vision. Some people are called to help make sure everything is in excellence. There are all different types of kingdom citizens. What we have to do is find where we're at and not try to compete and try to be like somebody else. How many of y'all seen People try to compare and try to compete and try to act like somebody else and it doesn't fit them. So you have to find your citizenship in the kingdom. What is it about you that makes you who you are that builds up the kingdom? Okay. And again, I don't say this disrespectfully. Some of you all may be called to the fivefold ministry, but everybody is not. There's more apostles than people out there now. Everybody's an apostle. Dear God. There's more apostles than people on the planet. So you have to make sure that you find your citizenship in where God has you to be because he will give you a grace to for your citizenship and it'll be easy for you. If you try to do something that you will not have a grace to do, it's going to be hard. And then you're going to wonder, how come it's not working? Maybe you're not in the right citizenship. All right, so look what Jesus said right here in Luke chapter 17, verse 20. I, we're going to be going to the Bible too, so I'm going to have some on the screen, some uh, through the Bible, because I know how you all need to see certain things in the Word of God. This is a different translation. You can feel free to go there if you like to, but I want to show you this out of the New King James Version. It says, now when he was taken by the Pharisees, or in this, in this illustration, in this teaching, I'm going to use the word Pharisees as just basically church people okay if y'all don't mind now i'm not talking against church people please understand because i'm a man of, of the church obviously but church people or religious people he was asked by the religious church people when the kingdom of god would come notice people who are children of god still have questions about the kingdom all right he answered to them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. In other words, you can't physically see the kingdom of, of God. 
nor will they say, here, here it is, or see there, for indeed, everybody say indeed, indeed the kingdom of God is where? Within you. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is within you. You can't go and say, well, where are you going on vacation? Oh, I'm going to the kingdom of God. No. <laughs> it ain't going to happen that way. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, same thing. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is God's way of doing things, but it's inside of you. Now, who lives in you? Jesus. More specifically, who lives in you? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God is in you. The Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom. He's the king of the kingdom because he lives in you. The kingdom of heaven is in you. Holy Spirit is in you. He's the one who rules the way you operate. And he always lines up with God the Father, God the Son, because they're all one. Okay? So God's ways of doing things, whenever you feel the world's way of saying, go this way, the kingdom of heaven, the Holy Spirit, rises up and say, no, you do it like this. Your mind is going to say, that doesn't make any sense. But if you are, I gave the illustration with the umbrella, I forgot to bring it today. But if you are submitted to under the kingdom of heaven, you're going to do it because he's Lord over your life. Y'all get what I'm saying so far? So a lot of times people feel like this. They'll say, like there's, let's just say there's an opportunity to do something for the kingdom. They will cop out and say something like this. I don't feel led to do that. Okay. I understand that. You do got to be led by the spirit. However, if the word says it and you say, I don't feel led then which one do you need to obey? The word. Because you can not be led by your own emotions. And your emotions can almost sound like God, but it's actually just you talking to you. So what happens is you have to be a student of the word, like I tell you all, and you got to know the word for yourself. So when something comes up and then the kingdom or Holy Spirit in you says, do it like this, and your mind got this war going on, and you say, See, some of, we try to rationalize everything. When you start rationalizing it, you're going to get yourself outside the kingdom. So, God will never do anything that he knows is going to kill you. Going back to foolish churches. So I just say, ain't no sense of taking four offerings up in one service. There's no sense. There's no sense of doing that. Okay? I'm sorry if some of y'all do that. I'm sorry. There's no sense of taking up four offerings in a service. What do you think? The money going to magically appear in people's pocketbooks? So sometimes people do that out of the flesh and they put a God stamp on it. I may get some hate letters off this one. But listen, you do your part by giving to the kingdom and then that's it. Okay, that's it. You do what you can do. If you have the two mites, then you give the two mites. Like she was just talking about. If you have, if God says you're supposed to give $20,000 every offer, then you give your $20,000. If you're supposed to do one hundred dollars, if you're supposed to, and I'm only getting on numbers because that's a God that most people are like. Oh Jesus, and trust me, let me say this as a disclaimer: I am not one of those preachers who go after your money. I work a full-time job every day. Amen. I do. I go to work. I feed my family. I go to work. Things that I'm doing when it comes to this, everything that gives to the kingdom, we put it right back in the kingdom. I don't take anything and put it in my pocket. Y'all don't see me riding on Rolexes, and I don't mind Rolexes, but I'm just not that. I'm not a flashy guy. Uh, so everything we do, we make sure it goes back into the kingdom. And I just believe that's what God wanted us to do. I'll go to work and I'll do that. Yes, one day I do plan on being in full-time ministry. But until that day comes, I'm going to work every day, clocking in, doing my job, loving my family, loving my wife, loving you all. Uh, and whatever we get from you all, we just t thank you, Lord, for this, whether it's great or small, and we give it right back to the kingdom. That's what we do. I ain't gonna, I ain't gotta try to Manipulate you all. If you don't give, you're going to be cursed. You're gonna, no, you, you, the curse is already there from what Adam, what Adam did. Yes. So if you don't want to submit to the kingdom, you already cursed. Ain't no sense of preachers getting up there and trying to scare you that if you don't do this, you're going to get cursed. No. You make sure you obey the kingdom. And if you get outside the kingdom, you ain't got, nobody got to tell you you're going to be cursed. Oh, that curse will knock on your door. So my point is this, that a lot of times when it comes to the kingdom, it's not something that you can say, because this person shattered and danced, because this person go to church every Sunday, because this person does this, oh, they're a kingdom. Let me bring balance. Kingdom people will do that. But don't think just because somebody knows how to do this, 
that automatically they're kingdom. There ought to be certain fruit that come out of them that are kingdom fruits and not flesh fruits. Are y'all following me so far? Yeah. Now this, this is kind of a message that almost kind of tears down a lot of learned behavior that we have learned in the church. But I'm not trying to get on anybody. I'm just trying to be responsible to you all that you have to do things God's way if you expect to get God results. Now, if you don't want God's results, don't do God's way then. Y'all get it? Some people will say, I want God's way, but they don't want to do God's results. And now they have these insane years like Nebuchadnezzar because they're like, I want to do my own thing. Now you out there, your hair growing out and your toes and everything, and you, you're insane because you want to live an insanity life trying to say you're God instead of him. Y'all get it? Yeah. Or you're like Martha. You want to do everything you can instead of just sitting down at the feet of Jesus. Instead of just listening to what he has to say, you got to figure it out yourself. And as a result, you have crazy. You're plucking all your hair out your head because you got to figure out everything. The moment you start getting the works of the flesh, Galatians chapter 5, Fits of rage? Where do you think fits of rage come from? Worrying, anxiety, trying to do things on your own instead of just submitting to the kingdom. I hope I'm talking to you all so far. So that's why he says the kingdom of heaven is within you. You will hear a voice behind the voice. Remember that verse I taught you all last few weeks ago? How you will hear a voice behind the voice saying this is the way, go in that way and walk in it. That's that still small voice that he's talking about. But it's a system. It's not a physical place. It's a system of operation. All right, so let me move on real quick. This is the storm. Forgive me my illustrations, but y'all can kind of picture it as I, as I say this. When Adam messed up, there was a storm that happened to the whole world. The Bible says everything you do will produce thorns and thistles. These are the thorns and thistles. So in other words, everywhere you go, no matter how well you do in the kingdom of the world, you will always have a storm and you will always have thorns and thistles, no matter how great you are. You can be the best person. You can be the, 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 uh, the nicest person. You can be the smartest person. But you still will have thorns and thistles because you are operating in the world's system. Whenever you submit to the kingdom system, then the kingdom of heaven produces like this umbrella. And then this is you right here where you can rest under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, do you know what the almighty name means? El Shaddai, which means the ever-breasted one or all-supply or all-sufficient. So I got these scriptures up here and I saw you all writing them down. Let's, get, let's jump in the word if you all don't mind. Psalms 91. Love Psalms 91. Love this one. David was really filled with the spirit when he was doing Psalms 91. So everybody, just go to Psalms 91. This is a slash Bible study class and, uh, you know, Sunday service. You there? Somebody read Psalms 91, verse 1, uh, and I'll just stop at 1, and I'll tell you when to go to 2. Either one. It doesn't even really matter. And loud enough so that people online can hear it. Oh, All trumpet right. man, I got you. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Good. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Most High is El Elyon, the Most High God. So notice he said, he who dwells in the secret place of El Elyon shall abide. Everybody say abide. Abide under the shadow, or in other words, like I got this right here, this umbrella, under the shadow of El Shaddai. What he's saying is, if you dwell in the place of safety, there's a certain covering that will just be automatic for you. If you can submit yourself to the kingdom of heaven. Now, there are storms that's raising all around you. A thousand can fall in my left hand, 10,000 in my right hand, but it will not come near me, says the Lord, right? So when he says, if you abide, again, everybody say abide. abide. What does abide mean? To stay there. To stay? Exactly. What else? Stay put. To rest. What else? Dwell. Dwell. Build there. 
live and abide. One of the things that I always hear whenever I hear the word abide is to remain. That's what it is, to, to remain all. And the Bible says like this, he who endures or remains to the end, the same shall be saved. So when Psalms 91 says, he who dwells in a secret place of the Most High El Elyon shall abide, live, remain, remain under the shadow of the Almighty or El Shaddai, he's basically saying that if you make a quality decision, if I say quality decision, if you make a quality decision to just do what God called you to do, and I know how hard that seems to some people, but if you just decide no matter what the world says because thorns and thistles are going to come, if I just make a decision then I'm going to just remain, dwell here under the shadow, then even though the rain is coming, it's not going to come near you. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to have hard times. The rain will fall on the what? Just and unjust. So you're going to get a little rain. But you will not go through a storm like the world unless you are doing this. Pretend I got an umbrella in my hand. Unless you're doing this, unless you're doing that, you're going to look just as wet as somebody who never had an umbrella. And a lot of people are like that. They got the umbrella here, they're remaining. They say, I don't feel like doing it because it doesn't work right. And then they go back and they go back and then they say, Lord, why am I still wet? Because you're not remaining under the shadow of the Almighty. Y'all get that? Yes. Okay. I know you already sat down, but look at verse 2. Uh, sir, can you, do you mind reading that one too? I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God and him will I trust. Read that again, please. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God. In him will I trust. So in other words, when the storms of life hit, he's saying you need to open your mouth and say something. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So he's not saying that the rain is not going to come. Okay? So many times, again, in bad religion, we've been taught, just shout it out, and then God will deliver you. Just shout. Just praise the Lord. And then you, get, you start shouting. You get the asthma attack or whatever, and you go home to them. Same things. And it's like, Lord, I shouted, I danced, I cut a rug up, I, I did everything, I rolled on the ground. And it's like nothing happened. Well, he's saying that when you abide under the shadow, the next thing you need to do when that storm comes, you say the, the exact opposite. He is my, what was it again? Refuge? Refuge and my fortress. Mm -hmm. He is my refuge and my fortress. Now, it looked like, let's just say somebody says, we're going to uh, turn your lights out. And you look like, Lord, I don't have the money to do this. That verse there says, whenever you see the storm coming, you don't just sit there and just, oh, Lord, I need to brace myself. No, you need to open your mouth and say, he is my refuge. He is my strength. In him, I will trust. Do y'all get that? A lot of times people don't do the warfare part of declaring the word of God. They know about, I need to come to church, let somebody pray for me. That's great. I'm not knocking that. But you got to go home and do like Psalms 91 verse 2 and says, he is my refuge. He is my fortress. In him I will trust. Somebody says, but it looked like they're going to kill you today. It looked like that's going to happen. He is my refuge. He is my fortress. In him I'm going to trust. No, you need to trust in yourself. You need to go out there and, and get a second job. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. But he is my refuge. He is my fortress. In him I will trust. Because no matter what I do in the world system, I'm going to get thorns and thistles. So I can never graduate to a place where nothing's going to hurt me. As long as I'm in the world, there's thorns and thistles and the rain is coming. Y'all see that so far? So that's why you have to submit to the kingdom of heaven. I know I got a whole lot of stuff going on on this one slide, but I'm going to show you why. All right, so he did Psalms 91 verse 1 through 2. Again, this little Bible study lesson. Now let's go to Hebrews because all three of these verses kind of connect together so you can build and build your faith in so that you can operate properly in, in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so everybody go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3 and 9 because 3 through 9 is pretty good, but I only want 3 and 9 because it will explain exactly what I'm trying to get. And when if you have it, you can go ahead and read that. A lot of people stay away from Hebrews. I don't know why. Um, but it's pretty good when it comes to resting in the things of God. And a lot of us 
are just so exhausted in life. You need some time where you can rest in the presence of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. Anybody have it? Just go ahead and just read that. Don't be ashamed. We're all family here. We all love you. For we who believe, that is, we who personally trust and confidently rely on God, enter that rest. So we have his inner peace now because we are confident in our salvation and assured of his power, just as he has said. As I swore an oath in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This he said, although his works were completed from the foundation of the world. Ooh, I love that, the foundation. Waiting for all who would believe. Waiting for all who believe. Love that verse. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you like I did in warfare. Okay. I like how she says, when it says right here in verse 3, Now we who have believed. How many believers we have here? All right. Now, know the, this verse right here is for you. Okay, I got to take you all line by line on this one because you have to build your faith in a certain area so that you can stand when the evil day comes. The Bible says, now we who believe, which is me, somebody say out loud, that's me. That's me. All right, so now we or I who believe, watch this, enter that rest. Now that rest is the rest that he's been trying to give Adam from the beginning. Adam messed it up. It would have been just easy a rest you just you do your job you do your stuff take dominion and just rule over the fish it would have been just so easy since he messed around and want to do some other things the the storm came in but God said that's okay I knew you were gonna do something so I provided something where you can still take advantage of that rest in the middle of the storm so that's why he said he who believes notice is not for the world it's for the believers okay we qualify. We who believe enter into that rest just as God said. So I declare an oath in my anger. They shall never enter into my rest. So in other words, God was saying he made a promise, an oath. Now, that's pretty big for God to make an oath. But he said it's only for the believers. Now, y'all follow me a little bit. Because when God swears something, that means it's a promise that he says, I will do this. The problem is. We don't, the Bible says in Hebrews, he who believes God must do what? Must first believe that he is and that he is a That's the issue right there. Some people have no problem believing that God even is, but they have a problem that he is, can reward you who diligently seek. They just think the blessings of God is for everybody but me. For some reason, the devil tricks us and make us think that they can be blessed, but you can't be blessed. But God is no respecter of person, right? And so God made an oath and says, those who believe can enter into my rest. You just said, I'm a believer. Now he says, you can enter into the rest. But then he goes and says, it's for those who believe that. If you don't believe that, that you can have this covering, no matter where the storm is coming, and that you can rest in it, you won't have that rest then. Because you don't believe that God is and that he's a reward to those who diligently seek him. So you are actually outside of that word. Are y'all following me? Yeah. Is this going over your head? Is it hitting your heart? Okay. Yes. Stay with me. Because here's the thing. The reason why God put all of these like, quote unquote, blues clues. My boys were limbo kids. We watch blues clues. So anyway. The reason why God put all these blue clues in there is because he was trying to tie everything back together from what Adam messed up. So the kingdom of heaven is God's solution to give you right back on track where Adam missed it. But you have to do it God's way. Don't eat the fruit. Well, I'm going to eat the fruit and I still want to be blessed. You outside the kingdom then. Y'all get it? So you have to do it God's way and have his mindset, his operation that if God says this is the way you're supposed to do it, no matter what your mind says, you're going to say, I'm going to submit to the kingdom. I know my mind is going crazy because some of us, we think, think, think things too much, don't we? Yeah. Analyze it too much. And now we have this analyst paralysis or whatever. We just paralyze ourselves. We don't go any further because we thought about it too much. Instead of just stepping out on faith and just saying the word says it, I may look like a fool, but because I trust in the name of the Lord, he is my refuge. He is my fortress and him. I will trust when you do it that way. You start seeing things change. But people got to say something and people are like, ooh, I can't do that because of A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 
Am I talking to y'all? All of us go through that. That's why he put a scripture like this in the Bible and says, I promise if you just trust me, I will give you the rest. See, you're tired from the world. I will give you shelter so that the rain won't be hitting you over the head. But you have to submit to the kingdom of heaven. Don't try to rest out here where the thorns and thistles are at. You have to get under the shadow of the Almighty. Is this making sense so far? Okay, so that's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. Can you skip down to verse 9, please? And what does it say there? So there remains a full and complete Sabbath rest for the people of God. Read that again, please. So there remains a full and complete Sabbath rest for the people of God. One more time, please. So there remains a full and complete Sabbath rest for the people of God. I see a lot of you all shaking your head like, yes, I get it. That's the rest that he tried to give Adam. That's the same rest that God sat down on the seventh day after he created man. So that rest has not been taken advantage of because too many people are too busy working, doing their own thing. Nothing wrong with working. But he's saying that there remains a rest. It's almost like you got this, you've been working hard at your job and they are required by law to give you a break or a lunch. Well, in the lunchroom, let's just say, has all of this free stuff. You can go in the lunchroom and you can get stuff free from the vending machine, let's just say that. You can get free stuff, you can, have, you can watch TV, you can sit on the couch, you can do all that. But you decide to stay at your desk or whatever and just kind of just uh, keep working. And you don't have to do that because he made a promise. Oh, thank you, Lord. I didn't even see this in my study time. He made a promise that those who believe can enter into this rest. But if you just don't want to do it, guess what? God ain't going to make you enter into that rest. He's not going to make you. So you have to decide. There's a resting room? Yes. Oh, okay, I'm going to take advantage of it then. If you, if you don't say stuff like that and operate under the kingdom, you're going to be sleep outside here. Because you're already going to be tired from the, the curse of the world, which is the world's curse. But if you don't take advantage and enter into that rest, then you have nobody to blame but yourself. Did y'all hear me? So um, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I just want you all to recognize the reason why some of the ways you're not resting like this under the shadow is because you're still trying to figure it out yourself. Selah. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Selah. That's a Selah moment right there. You're trying to figure it out yourself and that's why you about to go half crazy. You have to give it over to God there are some things in your life you're not going to have the answer for it. I don't have enough for this. I can't do it. I don't know what's going to happen with here, but I am going to submit and just trust you, Lord. This is what you told me to do. Okay, I'm going to do it. But you know, he's got, yeah, I know what's going on. But Lord, you know, okay, so I trust you. And then you just enter into that rest. God said, okay, here's, here's the place you got to enter into. And you just kind of just abide under the shadow. But as long as you, Lord, you're taking too long. I got to figure this out. Okay, let go the rain then. Here come the storms and here come the thorns and thistles. But you have to submit and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The kingdom of heaven is within you. In other words, you have it right now. You don't have to wait. It's already there. You just have to decide right here, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be ye changed how? By the renewing of your mind. Is it 12 and 2? I think it is. If it's not, it's going to be today. Anyway, but I think it's Romans 12 too. You be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. Once you get it right here, you'll start to see all of these other promises. You're like, how come I didn't take advantage of this? Your mind wasn't renewed. You either had bad teaching or you just saw it, but you didn't see the scripture. You didn't hear the word behind the word. All right. So he says there remains a rest for the people of God. It's reserved for you. But he ain't going to kick you in there and make you just take this rest. you got to decide, I'm going to do this. It doesn't have to be as hard if I don't want it to be that hard. we got another year coming up, family. Eight, the year of new beginnings. Seven is completion. What if this section of this life is complete? And then when you come in, you got this whole new thing. What if this is just the ending of all of that storm? What if? I'm just saying what if. I'm not trying to say, oh, 80s, you'll see. I'm not doing all that. But I am saying that what if 
This is it. Because you know how preachers we do. On them New Year's service, we've got to get a rhyme with everything. I'm not going to do that to you all. But uh, I am saying that that number eight is significant. Eight is new beginnings. What if we're learning all of this because God got to get your mind ready? Yep, you got to get ready for whatever's coming next. She's about to jump out of her seat and say that. I heard you. But you know what? Could it be possible that God is trying to renew our minds so by the time we enter into this rest, we, we know I, I belong here. Thank you, Lord. There remains a rest for the people of God. Yeah, this is Bible study a little bit. But how many of us have not been taught to go into the rest of God? Rest. You've been toiling all of this time, toiling and toiling, and you're tired and you're tired. And you're like, Lord, when is it going to end? You need to rest. Submit to the kingdom, abide under the shadow, and just go to sleep. But I still got bills. Still go to sleep. Y'all get it? But you have to make sure that you're not sleeping outside the kingdom of heaven. Abide under it, and then you can rest and get some good sleep after that, you know? But as long as you're trying to take this and put it out here in the thorns and the rain, your sleep is going to be interrupted by the next bill collector who's going to call you. And I'm just using that because that's, that's the thing that controls a lot of people's, um, you know, decision making is money. All right. But what if money is not the issue? What if you can still have bills and it don't freak you out and you can still abide under the shadow of the almighty? That's freedom, actually. That's a whole lot of weight off you. Did you do whatever and then God still takes care of you? Yeah, you may not be totally out of debt on this or whatever, but you are supplied for. You still going on vacation. You still enjoying life. You still have a smile on your face. You're not defeated and, and despaired. And you're not. What if all of that is taken off and you just abide and rest? For some of you all, this is your this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to rest underneath the shadow. And I'm not saying the rain has stopped. A lot of people are believing, Lord, stop the rain. I'm not going to stop the rain because Adam already messed it up. But I will give you something that the rain won't hit you. And for some of you all, and I say this by faith, this is you. That's me. Yeah, me. there you go. Claim it. That's me. No thorns are touching me. No rain is touching me. I'm abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. And the kingdom of heaven is already in you. You can have this right now. You don't have to wait until, well, in seven more days or next year. No, you can have it right now. Right now. You got to believe that you receive it. All right. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Are y'all getting anything? I'm trying, sir. I'm trying. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to let one of you all go there and just uh, read it out loud whenever you can. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Very good. Read it again, please. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. What's the first word in that verse? Let. Let. What does that mean? Allow. Allow. So in other words, when all of this other stuff come in, yes. you have to let Amen. the peace of God. Because what happens is the peace of God is trying to come. But you're not letting it. Y'all get it? You're not letting it. That's why he also says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. So he's saying, when that thing comes up, you have to let. That's the word for a lot of you all. You got to let it happen because the peace of God is not for everybody who does everything right. The peace of God is those who let it happen. I see what's going on, Lord. I see the storm is coming. And I'm going to let the peace of God that does what? What was this say again? It says, let the peace of Christ rule. Rule, rule. in your heart. Or supreme, has supreme dominion uh -huh. over your hearts. When your heart is troubled, let the peace of God rule that. I don't know what's going to happen. Let it rule. I saw your hand. Yes, ma'am. What do you have? Be you think I was you jumped ahead of me. I was just about to get there. <laughs> That's okay. She 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 jumped out there. So you gotta remember to have Thanksgiving. Yes. 
Because Thanksgiving, I mean, I think it's the book of Philippians. It's a Thanksgiving chapter, isn't it? Yeah, all of Philippians is talking about be thankful. Be thankful. Why? Because Thanksgiving helps propel you to the next level. Because what happened to the ten lepers? Go show yourself to the priest. They all went. As they went, they were healed. One came back. He says, where, where the other one at? Well, I just want to give thanks. One came back to give thanks, and he says, you're whole. The other ones, they were probably healed. But he's told you, you're whole. It's a difference. Now, people just thank God for the healing. But they don't, since they don't have thanksgiving, they don't have wholeness. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing taken away. All of that is whole. Now, thanksgiving releases wholeness. A lot of times we just kind of say, as a cliche, thank you, Lord. But it's not thanksgiving. You have to have a thanksgiving heart. Lord, I thank you. Where it's bad, I thank you. If it's good, I thank you. People like to thank God only when the good things, right? You have to have an attitude of thanksgiving because it says when to let the peace of God rule your hearts, then it says thanksgiving. That means you're not out of it yet. You're still in it. So while you're in it, let the Redeemer Lord say so, but don't forget to thank him. Sila. Stop trying to figure everything out. I feel like I'm just kind of coaching us a little bit. Because what happens is you're spending all of your energy trying to figure this thing out. You forgot to thank the Lord. You forgot to let the peace of God rule your hearts. And you up there reacting to the storm. All you got to do, that's you, right? All you got to do. You never see this person fighting against the rain. When the last time you've seen people fighting against the rain? Stop hitting me, stop hitting me. No, they just kind of just take an umbrella and go through the storm. But it seems so ridiculous to fight against the rain, but you know what? That's what people are doing. The storm comes and they're just fighting, fighting the rain, fighting the rain. And you wonder why you're so tired. <laughs> you're fighting the rain. What, what's wrong with you? But the world system says, fight the rain. The kingdom of God says, rest. Now, your spirit is saying, which one you think makes sense? You know, your spirit is telling you that, but you'd be shocked at all the people who's fighting the rain. And now they're sweating and they're raining, so you're more wet. <laughs> Stop fighting the rain and just do this. And sleep. And let the rain hit the umbrella. Because it's not going to come near you. I'm telling you all, this is some of you all's life right here. But you have to abide under the shadow. You won't do this unless this is here. And a lot of times people want the rest, but they don't want to submit to the kingdom. They don't want to abide under the shadow. They don't want to do what God tells them to do. And a lot of stuff, of course, obviously, is in the word of God right now. But if you've never read it, you wouldn't know. And my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, whatever's not in the Bible, if it's a gray area, then guess who speaks? The Holy Spirit, he will tell you no or yes, because, you know, there's some things in the Bible. You're like, Lord, I don't see it in the word. Well, the Holy Spirit lives in you and he'll tell you, don't do that. And if it's to you sin and you still do it, then guess what? You, you, you're acting just like, like you're going against the word. The Holy Spirit is in you for a reason. He's a helper, the Bible says. So you just keep ignoring the warning signs and going past all of this. And the Holy Spirit saying, no, no, no. And now you out there. How come it's raining on my head? Because you bucking the system. All right. Y'all get anything? This is good because I think a lot of us want this, myself included. And also, the Lord said, tell them now. You also have to, I'll say it the right way. You have to position yourself to be blessed. What I mean by that is make decisions where it's easy for God to bless you. Here's my point. A lot of times people just say, bless me, Lord, and they're expecting, I guess, money to fall down from the sky. Then there's another person that says, bless me, and so they'll try to go get a different job, or they'll, they'll set themselves up in a different location so that God can bless them. Now, God has no problem of blessing people. It's just a lot of times we want God to do everything for us, and we don't want to take necessary steps to be in a position so God can bless us. Does that make sense? So, if you want God to bless your finances and you complain about your job, look for another job where God can bless you. Now, you may say, oh, but what about this? What about this? 
I know. I understand. But that's when you have to let the peace of God rule your hearts. And you have to declare, he is my fortress. He is my strength. Now, don't get all crazy. Because I know when it comes to prophetic voices, it's a launching thing. And sometimes you don't think. God also gave you a brain. So I am saying count the costs, yes. But at the same time, don't be up there complaining about this, that, that, that. And you don't set yourself in a position where God can give you something different. Y'all hear me? I'm not saying go out and change your job. I'm just using that for an illustration, okay? Because you can be the only person in your own way from that blessing. Nobody's blocking it. It's not haters. It's not the devil. It's you. And so sometimes you're asking God to bless you, but you want to stay in one spot. And God is like urging you to move on. And like, no, Lord, you have to bless me right here. Okay, now who's the Lord? You or him? So if God says, I want to bless you, and then he says, move from where you're at, Abraham, into a place that I will show you. He's not going to bless you in, in that area if you don't be obedient and say, okay, Lord, I'm going right here. And then when you get there, he says, okay, I can bless you now. But we have to walk with him and not try to say, God, bless me on my own terms. It's 2018. I thought you said it's my season. Well, you didn't get out the boat. So you, you're going to stay there and complain about it's not working. If you want something different, you have to do something different. You have to. And you got to take risk. So a lot of times you know it's God when he stretches you a little bit further than what you're used to. I know that's God. Every time he does that, and, I, and it kind of scares If it doesn't scare me, I don't get involved with it. Because I have learned. I have walked with God long enough to know that whenever God says something, and I know right here I can't do it, and then the devil's telling me this, and I go in the scriptures, and, he, and, he, and I can see this, and it sometimes it takes a while, you can see that these are promises lined up, then sometimes you gotta kind of just inhale, close your eyes, and just, just do it. And if you fall, at least I fell trusting the Lord. That's what that whole thing for Arizona with me, I just feel like I'm telling my life story a little bit. I didn't know where I was gonna, where I was gonna live. When we moved from Memphis to Arizona, I told my pastor and the other overseers, I'm leaving. And I didn't, I did it in the right way. I said, I'm leaving because God called me to go on to start this ministry, the foundation of the World Church. He said, it's time. And they said, well, do you know anybody out there? I said, no, no. Do you have anything lined up out there? No. Do you have a job? No. Where are you going to live? I don't know. It was the biggest step of faith I've ever made in my entire life at that point. We drove, we sold everything from our house powdered into that car. Boy, that car was full too. It was like, you, the, the trunk, the trunk itself was almost touching the ground. And you know the headlights? The headlights, like they was like, like that. You know, it was like it had an expression. But anyway, we drove that car, that car like, you know. But anyway, it was, it was, it was crazy. So we drove both our cars, me and my wife, we didn't have the cell phones. So we had, we went to Walmart, got some little CB. So that was our, that was our phones. <laughs> driving i'm trailing her and she got one of the boys both of the boys i got all this other stuff in the car and we just talking 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 three days not even knowing where we're going just driving 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 and then when we got there things start falling into place but in the beginning it didn't happen that way and so sometimes you won't be able to figure everything out you have to just trust god inhale close your eyes and go for it and that's a rest actually um, but you know what? Once that happened, I stepped into another dimension of faith and it caused me to do it again. How do you think I got to Arizona? I mean, how do you think I got to Georgia? I was in Arizona and the Lord said, okay, you've done everything here in Arizona. No offense, family in Arizona, but they're not receiving the ministry that I have for, in this area. Go to Georgia. I'm going to build the church. There. First he said, start the church. And he just wanted me to just get out of my comfort zone. But then he says, George is the place where you're going to build it. That's where you're going to stay. I, again, that time I had a job, but it was so, and I, forgive me, I'm just going to take two minutes to tell my little life story. That time I had a job, but the job was iffy. They said, we'll transfer you and we'll put you in a hotel. And that's what that was the agreement. I started out, no, the day before I started out, they said, oh no, we can't do that. We can't put you in a hotel. Um, if you get here, you can get here, but we ain't got nowhere to place you. And so I had a dilemma. I'm going to another city I've never been in. I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't know where I'm going to do anything. 
and I just kind of inhaled, closed my eyes, got in the car because my wife didn't get her job transferred yet. I was the only one. I drove the car by myself. Remember that voice? They're like, where'd daddy at? He gone. And I didn't, I, I didn't abandon my family. I just had to leave because I had to go set the, the pace for the family. I drove and as I was driving, I'm like, Lord, I don't even know where I'm, I'm going to Georgia, but I don't even know where I'm going to sleep. I don't even know what I'm going to eat. My wife, since, she, since we took the Arizona thing, she already knew the kind of faith that we had. So she was just saying, it's all going to work out. We don't know, but it's all going to work out. So I took as much money as I could without breaking the, the, the household so that I can eat. And I was planning on eating cheese and crackers if I had to. I was planning on eating cheese and crackers and water, and that was going to be my breakfast, lunch, and dinner because I knew God called me to go to Georgia. As I'm driving, as we went, like the 10 lepers, as I went, I got a phone call from my dad, and he said, I heard that you're going to Georgia. Um, where are you going to live? And I said, Dad, I don't know. And then he just talked, and he said, you know what? You got an uncle in Georgia. What? I had no idea. He lives in Marietta. That's exactly where my training was going to be at. And then he says, Tell you what, I'll just call him and let's see what we can do. I hung up the phone, still driving, going past New Mexico, going into Texas, didn't hear anything. Dad calls back, yeah, your uncle, never met him before. Your uncle, uh, he's well to do and he's gonna pay for your hotel. In fact, he's gonna put you in a, in a uh, house that he's renting out to somebody else for free. And it's right next door to you know where I was at. And I recognize the Lord did call me to do this, but it was, in the, I don't know what's going to happen, but once I did it, I got outside the comfort zone, I started seeing everything fall into place. And I don't know why I'm telling you all that, but that's how a lot of your walking by faith is going to look like. You're going to be like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm just going to step out anyway. And as you go, you're going to be healed and whole. Make sure you bring Thanksgiving though, because that's how it will seal everything. So long story short, I came here. You all know the story. We started the church. We're still going right now because I've been faithful over a few things. And then God is obligated because I didn't know you all. You all didn't know me. How'd you all find me? Internet, right? I'm just a new kid on the block. But God added to the church as he wanted. And every single one of you all are kingdom people who God has strategically placed here. Okay? Didn't mean to say all that. Can I, can I take two or can I take my maybe 20 more of your minutes? You all, it's 12, 15. Normally I'd be wrapping up, but I got to show you these last three stories and I promise I'll let you go. Is that okay? If you have to leave, it's fine, but I, I don't want to leave this part without showing you this. So you got thorns and thistles right here, Colossians. And why was the thorns and thistles so important? What is another significant place in the Bible where you saw thorns and thistles? What did Jesus have when he went to the cross? There you go. Crown of thorns. Why was the thorns? Because he was basically saying, I'm taking the curse from Adam, the thorns and thistles, putting it on my head, and I'm taking it to the cross. Which means you come through me. That was good, wasn't it? I got goosebumps all on me now. But listen, when you come through me, which is the kingdom of heaven, I have taken the thorns. That's the world's way of operating. They got thorns and thistles. They can't get through away from the thorns. But if you come through me, I have nailed the thorns to the cross. That's why he had to pick. Yo, you like that, Miss Victoria? You like that? Thank you. I think it was pretty good. God gave me that this morning. I said, wow. I'm just like the north. I'm like, wow, the thorns. I see it. But notice those, these are blues clues that God was telling you that I'm trying to make all things new. Isaiah chapter 43. I'm doing a new thing. Can't you see it? I will make rivers in the desert and streams in the wasteland. So God does these new things. We have to keep up with him. Y'all hear me? So a lot of times you're going to feel a nudging for you to do something different. It's not for you to be afraid because your mind going to get in the way. But if you know it's God and you know it lines up and bears witness with your spirit, take it from somebody who's taken a lot of risk. Inhale and do it. And you'll find yourself just like this. I have no fear about this church because God has proved me over and over and over again. He's going to take care of it. That's why I'm not concerned about who's here or, or listens. Thank God for you all. But unless the Lord builds the house, the labor is labor in vain. 
So here's my last three. And again, if you all have to go, you can. But I got to show you this because this is one thing I think destroys. If it, it okay, everything that God has is almost like Satan gives some type of counterfeit to it to stop it. And if it's one thing that I can put a pin on, in fact, I'm going to let you all discover it. But watch this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. We all heard this before. No one can, what's this word? Serve, serve two masters. No one can serve or be submitted to. If you're going to be under the umbrella, either you want to be dry or you want to be wet. You got to decide which one you're going to serve. Joshua says what? You will choose this day who you will serve. serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. All right? So Jesus again. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, love the other, or else he will be loyal. Uh-oh, what I do? Is that me? That was me. I pressed the wrong thing. Or, or else he will be loyal. Everybody say loyal. loyal. Loyalty is a, is a big thing when it comes to serving. Because you can serve and not be loyal, but actually they kind of come together if you think about it. True serving means that you are loyal. If you are true serving something because you can uh, attend and be a part. But if you are serving, there's a degree of loyalty. Would you all agree with that? Yeah. So when he says no one can serve two masters, he's basically saying nobody can serve and be loyal to two systems. Oh, I got ahead of myself to 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 loyal to the one and despise the other. Watch this. You cannot serve or be loyal to God, which is the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, and mammon. What is mammon? The world system. Some versions in your Bible calls it money, doesn't it? It says, can I be loyal to God and money? I know the NIV says it. Well, that's a, that's a pretty good, accurate translation because the system that they were referring to is a financial system. But it doesn't, when he says mammon, it's, it's almost like majority financial, but it doesn't include just financial. Because financial is such a big thing to everybody, yeah. it was translated as money. But it's more than that. Because some people don't have money problems. They have stress problems. So he's basically saying that if you're going to serve God's kingdom, be devoted and be loyal to God's kingdom. If you're going to be the, uh, if you're going to serve the world system, then be devoted and loyal to the world system. But you cannot do both. You can't be world system one day and then decide to be kingdom the next day. You're going to have to make a choice which one you're going to serve. And that's what a lot of people think, especially in the body of Christ. We think we can kind of just do just like the world. We can do whatever we want and then do what the world sa do what the word says. But you have to decide, I'm going to serve or be loyal to the kingdom. You hear me? And some of us, it may take a lifetime. It shouldn't. But... A lot of us take a long time deciding who are we really going to serve. Now, when a, a bad, God forbid, life event happens, we'll say, OK, Lord, OK, I'm going to serve you. But did it have to come to that? Yeah, they put a gun to my head and, and I saw I heard the God's voice and everything. But it's like God been trying to get my attention before then. I just didn't respond until I saw the gun. But it doesn't take all that. You can just decide, I'm going to be loyal to the kingdom or be loyal to the world system. Whichever one you're going to do, just recognize if you're going to be loyal to the world system, then yes, this is your fate then. Thorns, thistles, storms. That's what's going to happen. You can still go through a storm and drive your car or get to your job and do all that. You're just going to be wet. You're going to have a lot of other stuff. You can catch a cold, whatever. Or you can do the same thing and have the kingdom of heaven. My point is this, people from the world, they insist on going through the thorns, insist on going through the storms, insist on just kind of fight the rain, because that's the world system. But he says you cannot do both. Either you're going to be kingdom or you're going to be of the world. But you have to decide which one I'm going to do. Now, he came out with that verse first, and this is going to bring me to my, my next point. It's so much in here. Do I need to, I probably, do I need to stop? I don't know. Y'all are here. I don't want to hold you all day. I don't know. If you have to leave, please, you can. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to push it all the way to the end, okay? All right. The reason why he gave you this verse first 
And if you all are in your Bibles, have you seen, are you already, okay. What is the next verse right after this? Pause. Read it again. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Okay, so he talks about you can't serve two masters, and then you gotta have either the world system or the kingdom system. Immediately after that, he starts talking about what? Worry. Worry. If there's anything that can stop you from being a citizen of the kingdom is worry. Worry is one thing that will get in your head and just make you think that everything is about to fall to pieces. And it causes you not to submit to the kingdom of heaven because you're worried about what if, what if this happens? Am I right? Yes. That is one, that's why Jesus said this first. Then he started talking about worry second because he knows you're going to have troubles in life. And worry shows up, which is actually fear, which is the opposite of faith. So fear shows up. Faith, if you don't have enough faith in the word, that fear is going to tidal wave it. So that's why he says, before we start talking about what's going to kill this, let me let you know that no one can do both. Don't think that you can be in fear and faith, fear and faith, fear and faith. It's not going to happen. You're going to have to decide, even though you may not understand it, I'm going to be in faith. Now, this tidal wave may come, but I'm still going to be in faith. Y'all hear me? He starts talking about worry, and let's just kind of just micro speed through that real quick. Um, and you all know this because it's, it's so familiar. It's Matthew chapter 6, and then it says right here, um, talking about worry. Do not worry about your life. I'm just going to read that. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food in the body, uh, important than clothes? Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you much more valuable than they? Who are you by worrying? Who are you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? If they said they're going to put you out, they say they're going to fire you, and you're like, Lord, what am I going to do next? Yes, that's worry, but you should not worry, he's saying right here. Okay? That is a life altering event. Yes, and it will cause worry. That's natural. However, let not your heart be troubled. You see, it's there. Let the peace of God rule your hearts. Y'all get what I'm saying? You have to decide what you're going to do. You have to decide who you're going to serve because this is going to come because it's part of the world. But when it does come, you have to decide, I'm going to rest. How am I going to rest? By letting not my heart be troubled. You got to decide that before everything hits the fan. Because if it hit the fan, you're going to find yourself reacting. So you got to set your mind, keep it set, and just go through with just inhale, close your eyes and say, Lord, it looks tough. I'm going to go through anyway. People got to decide that. If you don't decide that, you already lost the battle. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies in the fields grow? Do they, lay, they, they, they do not labor or spin. Yet, I tell you, not even Solomon was splintered and dressed like, like these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is today here and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will not, will not much Will he not much more clothe you? Then he goes and says, oh, you of little faith. You're more in fear than in faith. Did y'all see that? So if the Lord is calling you ye of little faith, basically fear is dominating you, which means you are in the world system. And that's why everything is going crazy because you have more faith in the world. All right, so watch this. Verse 31, so do not worry, saying, what are we gonna eat? How are we gonna pay these bills? How are we gonna get this done? How is this going to happen? Where am I going to work? How, can, how come this is not happening right? Don't worry, he's saying. And I know that's a little easier said than done. I know. But he's telling you not to do this. So do not worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What should we wear? Verse 34. The pagans or the world people, people of the world, world system, worldly minded people worry about stuff like this. After all of these things, your Heavenly Father knows you need them. Verse 33, very familiar. We all quote this one. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Watch this. And all of these things will be added unto you. If you seek the kingdom, all of this other stuff that you're worried about will be added unto you. 
So don't be thinking, well, I just, if I just apply for this next job, if I just do this, if I just kind of make a dollar out of 15 cents right here, and maybe I can call them and negotiate, and if I can get an extension, hold on. If you seek the kingdom, he's going to take care of that. Now, I know how that sounds. Pastor, you don't understand. Last time I tried to seek God, and I got put out, and I was living in my in a hotel, living in my car. I understand. But were you submitted to the kingdom? Sometimes you got to ask yourself, was I in a different state? stage of God than I am right now all right therefore do not worry about tomorrow verse 34 for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own and Lord Jesus that's right don't even stress yourself out on it okay so what I'm gonna do is since you know worry is the very thing that stops you from operating in the kingdom you have a decision to make and what I'm gonna do now is show you these three last people and I'm, you don't, I'm going to give you the scripture and I want you to read it in your, in your homework time. But I want to talk about these people and then I'm going to let you go. The first person is, first thing is, kingdom citizens control worry. That's exactly what we just read. I just forgot I had that point in there. So you got to take worry just like this. How if it's coming, you got to block it and knock it out the way. Okay? Or you try to jump over this thing and you, and you clip it because worry tripped you up. And then you're like, oh Lord, how come I couldn't do this? And you start beating yourself down. You don't need to be this person. You need to be the person that, hey, I'm going to just knock it out, okay? And, uh, but too many, the world, people of the world are like this. Because worry is getting them and they're stressed out. They can't focus. They can't do anything right. And now they popping off on other people because of worry, all right? You got to submit yourself to the kingdom and just be focused and knock it out. Y'all get it? So kingdom citizens control worrying. I'm not saying that when worry comes that you don't worry. It's just that you control it. Y'all get it? That's why he says, let not your heart be troubled. That's why he says, don't worry. A kingdom system has a degree of maturity that even though it looks bad, I'm not going to worry about it. What do you mean you're going to worry about it? Don't you know we're going to? I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to go to God. He knows what I need. I submit to the kingdom. I submit to him. It's going to be just fine. I'm going to go to sleep. You can't be sleeping now. Why, 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 why? I'm going to go to sleep. Kingdom citizens control worrying. Not saying that they're not getting stuff happen, but they don't freak out like everybody else. Again, I said kingdom says it's not church folk. Church folk, oh Jesus, y'all pray for me, oh Lord. <laughs> now there's nothing wrong with prayer. We can, we, you know, intercessory prayer, you need to be around the family of God so we can pray. I get that. But if you're coming down every day because you, you worry, and you can always tell when they're like not in faith. Maybe I can tell because I, I do this a lot. But storms are going to come and you're going to be freaked out but it's how you handle it yes. that determines are you a mature kingdom citizen yeah I know I got this issue going on and, and it's bad but you know what I'm believing God for this you're controlling that worry then instead of oh y'all help me so I'm like, can, can, can you give me five dollars can, can I get five dollars hold on that five dollars is not going to be the thing that's going to help you you got to learn how to manage worrying all right now that's what I want to say too. These are the three people. You can write this down. You got to go. I know. I'll give it to you on podcast. Love you. All right. So kingdom citizens, this is what I want to say. And I promise I'm done after this because I don't want to keep you all day. Kingdom citizens are everywhere. Everybody say everywhere. everywhere. Kingdom citizens are everywhere. They don't look like, oh, you're kingdom. No, they're everywhere by, you can tell by their fruit. Okay. So here's my, here's my three people and by looking at them you don't know who they are I know who they are but when I start describing them you're like oh yeah wait a minute I got the names on it so that's why he's gonna make you go oh yeah but anyway so first person Cornelius the centurion if you know the story about Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 the Bible says that he gave regularly that word always messes me up he prayed often but this guy was a centurion. If you know anything about centurions, they killed some folk. They didn't get there by just voting. No, they, they, were, they were some people who will cut you down. But this guy, uh, Cornelius, was a centurion, which means he had over 100 men underneath, underneath him. Century is a hundred, right? Not a thousand. Okay, so it's 100 men underneath him. All right, but notice, he looked like a Roman enemy. Jews didn't like the Romans because they was oppressing them. But this guy was an anonymous giver. 
He just supported the kingdom. He always gave to the synagogue. And he was killing people. But he was, he was a giver. And an anonymous man of prayer. So sometimes you may look at people, your boss or somebody or a politician, and you say, hmm, they look, they're from the devil. Hold on, you don't know if they're a man of prayer. You don't know if they're giving. They're not showing you this, but they're, they're, he's a kingdom man. He's a Roman. He's not your quote unquote churchy man, but he's kingdom. And sometimes you can kind of just tell people like, you're a kingdom man, aren't you? He appears to have a hard shell. Oh, I meet people like that all the time, especially when I would go to the prisons. Those guys that look all hard and everything and, you know, kind of mean mugging and kind of intimidate you. You start talking about the kingdom of God, that stuff melts. They'd be like, oh, Lord. And it's like because they can't, they can't help it. They're sheep that know his voice. So don't be looking at, mm, they look like they don't like my message. Don't you pay attention to that. Because it could be a kingdom man like Cornelius. He looked like he didn't, wasn't paying attention to anything. But this was a man who gave to the kingdom. Nobody didn't tell him, to, and that's another thing. Nobody didn't tell him to do it. It wasn't no law. Even if he was, got the Jewish law, he's not a Jew. So why did he give? He gave because I'm supposed to help. And some people are just like that. I'm supposed to help you. Their kingdom. I'm supposed to pray for you. They don't even know why. And so don't look at what it looks like on the outside because Cornelius, you got some Corneliuses in your life right now. They don't even look churchy, but they're Cornelius. They will help you when you get into a point when it's something you start doing for the kingdom, they will help you. I have met them. They will pray for you. And they may not come to church every Sunday, but they're praying for you. That's saying that you're supposed to judge them. But look at that in your homework. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through 6. Some of you probably already know that story. The next person, one of my favorite, the Shunammite woman. Shunammite. She was not from Israel. She was a lady from Shudam. And if you look at it, the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, that there was a great woman who saw Elisha coming by her house. And the Bible calls her a great woman. You know what that means? Great. Good. What else? Oh. Influential. Influential. Wealthy. Uh, somebody who was content. They didn't need anything. This woman, she wasn't looking for a handout. She was somebody, and the Bible says that she was like discerning. She was just at her nice house and she saw the prophet, the man of God walking past and she discerned, this is a man of God. And here's the next thing she said, we got to help him. Who told her to do that? She went to her husband. Uh, we got this house. Let's build another wing to our house. If he's a good husband like me, he went, uh, yes, ma'am. He just did it, right? So they built a prophet's chamber, a bed, a couch or a bed and a chair and a desk and a lamp. And he, and she just said, hey, man of God, you can come to my house. She wasn't trying to get anything from him, though. She just wanted to be a blessing. Shunammite wasn't even part of the tribe of Israel. And she was sacrificial. She just took time out of her schedule to say, you know what? I'm supposed to help you. She didn't know it. She's a kingdom person. She's a kingdom citizen. And she was honest because what happens was you all know the story. If you don't, I'm just give you a quick recap. Elijah was the man of God, and she, she saw him and said, we got to help this man of God. Why? Because we do. I just know I got to, my part in history, I'm supposed to help this guy. So what happens is she set herself up to be blessed, to be a, be a blessing. If you know the story, Elijah said, man, this Shunammite woman, she's been such a blessing to us. We got to do something for her. What, what can we do, Gehazi? And he said, well, she ain't got any kids. And then she, he said, okay, we'll call her back in here. And she came back and he says, you're going to have a son. You know the story. She said, no, I don't want a son. In other words, my hope has already been fine. I'm already sustained. I don't want to get my hopes up again because I don't want to be hurt again. Here's my point that I got right here. She was honest about her delivery. The shooter mites in your life can be honest on, I can help you this far, but I can't help you right here. 
I can deliver, but I can't deliver on this. In other words, they're not the kind of people that just say, oh yeah, 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 I got it, I got you, I got you, and they don't deliver. No, these kingdom citizens from the Shunammites, they'll say, I got you, I got you, I got you, but I don't got you right here. Always pay attention to people when they talk. Shunammite woman, she was very honest. And again, she set herself up for a blessing. You know the story. She did have a son that time next year. And I love the part that when the son died, she was so buttoned up. She was so buttoned up that when they said, what's wrong? She said, oh, all is well. In other words, she's not flaky. These people are just stable. And they're not flaky. If they say they're going to be there, they'll be there. If they're not, they'll tell you, I'm not. Y'all get it? So, Shunammites. People, you're going to find people that, like that in your life. They will just help you. Why? Because you're on the kingdom. They're on the kingdom. They're, they're, they're working together with you. We all get to the same spot. While they're helping you, God is helping them. But it's not, they're not in it for the reward. They're in it because it's part of their purpose. Y'all get it? Some people just want to be a blessing to you because it's part of their purpose. Last one. King of Harem of Tyre. King Harem of Tyre. Second Samuel. You probably don't hear about this guy too much because no, nobody really preaches on it. But when I was reading the word, he jumped out to me and the Holy Spirit said, he's a kingdom citizen. All right. So Second Samuel chapter 5 verse 10 is only two, two scriptures. But the Bible says that David, you know the story of David. He was running from Saul. He was in the strongholds. He was doing all of this. And then it got to the point where they finally accepted David to be king. And then they said, you're our king now. Now, before this, Saul was king, but Saul had kings like, like a kingdom, but he was still like in tents in different places. He was the king, but he didn't have a house, a, a palace. David became king. This guy built him a palace. You see what I'm saying? You get certain people who will sponsor the kingdom. He already has his own kingdom. And I like this. He's not intimidated by anybody. You get some people that will just, they're kingdom citizens and they don't think that you're their competition. That's how you know that these are kingdom citizens. Whenever you get somebody that's like, oh, you're doing well, it makes me look bad, and they kind of like look at you sideways, they're probably not kingdom or they're probably not called to help you. Hiram was not intimidated. You're a king, I'm a king, I'm going to help you build a palace. Whoa. Who told him to do that? David didn't tell him that. The Holy Spirit told him to do that. And Hiram built King David a palace. He's, this is a guy who can, they're like investors. They can see potential in kingdom citizens. Sometimes they can see where you're at and be like, you're going somewhere. I'm going to get behind you and push you. Those are people that are just like, you need people like that. Because when you're at your point where you just, you have like a, let's just say a vision, you can only take that vision so far. You need the Hirams, you need the Shudamites, you need the Corneliuses to kind of like say, let me help you. And that's why God put kingdom citizens around to help you build the kingdom because it's not your kingdom you're building, you're building his kingdom. So he strategically places all of these people. Now again, I place these three people up here because I want you to recognize that all of them were not quote unquote churchy people. Y'all get it? So don't only lock in kingdom citizens and people who go to church. Let me bring, bring balance to that. I'm not saying that church people are not kingdom. I'm just saying that some of your kingdom citizens may be in politics. They may be business owners. They may be other people that's doing a lot of different things. And if you only categorize them as, do you go to church on Sunday? Who your pastor? If you do that kind of stuff, you're going to miss out. So you need to recognize the kingdom people in your life. And you also got to recognize, am I a kingdom citizen? Do I have qualities like this? Because that's how a true kingdom citizen is. They may come in all different kinds of colors, but God knows which ones are of the kingdom. Y'all get it? I talked your ear off all day, but you sat here and listened to me. I appreciate it. I love you all. I think I'm done. Okay? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's stand up and let's pray and let's, let's go home from here. Lord, I thank you. And we don't have to do the altar call or it took enough time. Lord, I thank you, Lord, right now, God, that you are our king over our lives. Lord, I pray, Lord, for these people, Lord, as they go 
out of this place, but not your presence, Lord. Let us walk out of here as kingdom people, Lord. Not just church people, but kingdom citizens, Lord. And allow us, Lord, to discern kingdom moves so that we can help advance your kingdom, Lord. That we don't have to be intimidated by anything that we think is a threat. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen, Lord. But we will put that umbrella up. Oh, we will get underneath that umbrella and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Bless your people, Lord, I pray, Lord. Cover them, Lord, as they go home, Lord, and this weather, Lord, and as we meet each time, God, bless them, Lord, I pray. Bless their finances and their health and their marriages and their families and everything that pertains to them, Lord. Let the peace of God rule their hearts, Lord. And we ask God right now, Lord, when these different storms come, Lord, that we can rise up in our citizenship of kingdom people and respond the right way. That we don't have to freak out with the world because the kingdom of heaven is within us. And I ask God right now, Lord, for your covering upon them, upon those that's watching, that they recognize kingdom principles and that they will be kingdom citizens. And Lord, we know that kingdom citizens are also church people, but don't let us just be church people and not kingdom citizens. So Lord, as we fellowship together and we leave this place, but not your presence, let your presence, Lord, be with us, God. And let us, Lord, not worry about tomorrow. And we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise for this. It's in Jesus' name, amen. I love you all. Hug somebody, and you all are dismissed. Love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. Thank you for listening to Upon the Rock broadcast. If you enjoyed this message, please visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for a free download. Also, please be sure to share this message with your family and friends on social media sites to help spread the word of God. Have a great week.